Hello everyone, this is lecture number three and uh, it's going to be a relatively shorter lecture because at the end of it I'm going to ask you to engage in a little exercise. Okay, let's get into it. Um, first, just a couple of reminders. So uh, there is a course survey that we would like you to do. Uh, that course survey is a Google form. It is available on Canvas and there's also an announcement about it, but it's in the modules for this week, okay? You please do that uh, as soon as you can, but no later than the end of the day Thursday. Um, I said Friday earlier, maybe, but uh, let's get it on Thursday, which is the same day as our quiz stuff, okay? Uh, so we are on a Thursday schedule for homeworks now. Um, just a reminder on that, and we're going to ask that you complete reading one and do the associated quiz with it before next Thursday. That's the 15th of October. So this coming Thursday will be the course survey, the Google form. The Thursday afterwards, the 15th of October, will be complete the uh, Donahoe reading and finish the quiz on that, okay? There is no discussion section this week, so the 9th of October, no discussion sections. Discussion sections are going to begin on week two, all right? So <clears throat> essentially when, what you're going to do next week for discussion section is you're going to have finished the quiz on reading one, which means you've actually read it, and you're gonna come into the discussion sections and you guys will talk more deeply about that reading. Okay, now next up, uh, also know that there is assignment number one coming. And I say coming, it's not coming until next month, okay? It's due on the 5th of November. So you have one month of time. Assignment one is to get together in your group <clears throat> that's going to be used for your final project. Okay, work in a group of four to five people. Uh, I think I said in question and answer that I'd be okay with bigger or smaller, but I I talked with people who have run this course recently and they're not into that. They think that it causes more trouble than it's worth. If you have a great proposal and a real definite reason to work in a group which is smaller than four or bigger than five, then I need a good rationale. So it's not just because we got our friends together. I will listen to those arguments, but I might say no. Okay? So assignment number one is to get started on your project. Basically, you need to draft up a bunch of stuff. You're gonna hand it in to us, and we're going to give you some critique on it. And hopefully you'll take that critique in and modify your proposal when you finally hand it in in the final project. Okay, you'll work on forming groups and formulating questions. You can do that in Piazza or in the discussion sections. The sections are a good way, of course, to meet people for your group. And so is Piazza if that's more your bag. I know we have a bunch of people participating completely asynchronously. So in their case, Piazza is pretty much the only way to meet people or, or Discord or whatever else is going on. Okay. Let's get into it. into it. So, today's lecture, questions, data science questions. And just when I'm ready to ask some questions, I have an annoying cat meowing. Look who came to visit. Magic doesn't have questions. Magic has meows. All right, enough of that. Go play somewhere else. All right, let's do some more. So, so, right. We need to, the first element of training data scientists really in, is to help them learn to formulate good questions that data can answer. So today's learning objective is indeed to do something to explain the data science process so you understand a little better what it involves. 
and we want you to be able to demonstrate the ability to move from a general question like some product manager might ask you to do when you're on a job that just doesn't really have any specificity to it, anything that can actually be answered, just vague ideas. And we need to help, and we need you to be able to demonstrate that you can take that general question and hone it down into something very specific that can be addressed. Okay? So, data scientists have a, I, I've argued already in this course that fundamentally one of the things really that's the most important skill of a data scientist is to have a data science mindset. To be driven by empirical things, by the data that you can find, okay? And to care about the right answers, not to be out there to give the answers that are gonna get you the next promotion at work, but to give answers that uncover something about the way the world works, okay? Something true. You know, there's poetry in truth, as uh, certain artists have said, right? So, but these answers, you know, they are driven by data and empirical observations, and you need to think about how you can take data which may be nebulous and not good enough and make it sing for you in a way which reveals something true. But yet at the same time, you don't want to, as they say, torture the data to give you the answers that you want it to, right? Um, why, do, why is it illegal to use torture to, uh, on prisoners of war to try to get information out of them? Because when you torture people, they give the answer they know you want, so they'll stop being tortured. Data is no different, right? That's the metaphor that people often talk about here, where torture the data until it confesses. We don't want you, we want you to be able to find hidden things in the data and think about how to do that. But at the same time, we don't want you to twist and turn the data until it says what you expect. So obviously the other elements of all this is that we need you to care whether the results make sense because caring is really about what the answers mean. You, you need to know what, you need to know that what you're trying to do is to get to some underlying truth and be able to use the empirical data to expose the holes in your knowledge, not to paper them over, right? And like I said, data do have errors, right? Data have inconsistencies. Data may not actually be able to reveal an absolute true or false. But that doesn't mean you don't gain something valuable by either trying or by using the, the, uh, the data as far as they do go to suggest what might be the next step to get to that truth. And in many ways, when you look at a data scientist here, right, the things I'm describing are not actually just data scientists. They are scientist things, okay? This is what the science perspective is, period. It's just that we, we're going to train you to do this with data in a very particular way. Okay. So. This is kind of a rough flow chart of how does data science work? What is this process? As you can see, you start with a question. You have to have a question that you can address, something which is both interesting, because otherwise, why spend the ta time, right? <laughs> I mean, if you don't, if you're not asking something interesting, then I don't think you should bother. Um, and it has to be answerable. It has to be something that you can actually get the data for. It has to be something that is specific enough to address. And that's where we're gonna work a lot today. Um, once you've got that question, you can move onwards to the process, right? To get the data, explore and model and communicate the results of this process, okay? All of these are critical, and we're going to go through them bit by bit during the quarter.
but today we're starting with that question. We're starting with answering the question. Sorry. Asking the question, because answers, again, are secondary, right? I mean, uh, there are times when asking a question may actually change the world, even if you don't have an answer. So here's a lovely quote. So if I had an hour to solve the problem and it was my life on the line, I would use the first 55 minutes to determine the proper question to ask. Because once then, I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. There are permutations of this kind of thing out there, but I mean, attributing anything to Albert is always a good way to impress people with its importance, because obviously the most prototypical scientist in the world must know what he's talking about, right? But the thing is, is that it's clear that if you try to answer things where you, you haven't fully specified what it is, the question, what is the question, right? Then you can get into trouble. You get shunted down the wrong path quite easily. But as soon as you have made it so concrete and so clear by asking the question that it's just a matter of filling in boxes on the form, then you're in good shape. So what makes a good question a good question? Well, I've already kind of hinted that specificity is important, right? If you're not specific enough that it's clear what the question is about, if there's room for wiggling and in interpreting the words in the question, then it's not specific enough. Obviously, if your question is not answerable by data, then you have no question at all. Uh, many philosophical questions come in this flavor, right? They, they may fundamentally be unknowable in the end, or they are questions about the world outside of the material world, if you're talking about religion and stuff like that, in which case material world stuff like data doesn't have a bearing on it, okay? We need to also specify what is being measured. It's not just that we have a measurement, but that measurement needs to be relevant to the question we're asking. We need to know what that measurement really means. We need to know the limitations of that measurement, where its errors may lie, what kinds of biases might be in the instrument that we're using to try to measure, okay? So, important. Right? Are we, are, we, are we able to say what's really important about these questions? Um, so you could ask questions that are fundamentally not interesting, right? You can ask questions that are interesting but don't have any impact. These are all kind of, I would call, I, I like to call these the, um, the hobby questions, right? Things you, things you actually find very interesting, but nobody else in the world does, okay, fall into that. Then you have questions that leave wiggle room for useless answers. Um, you know, what should I do, right? I mean, it's just so, so nebulous a question, so unanswerable, because in the real world, there's an infinite number of choices of what you should do. And so fundamentally, just even couching questions in these terms are fundamentally useless. So things that are good and clear and specific enough and potentially have an impact are what we're after here. Let's uh, get my face out of the way so you can actually read the questions, right? Something very specific, like, how many of X will this company sell during this time frame? Okay, it's clear what the question is. One assumes that there's an importance to Tesla in this case, right? The company that makes Model 3s, whether they, they would really want to know that potentially because they have to change 
factory output in order to meet that demand. Okay. UCSD needs to know how many students are going to come in and also how they need to fiddle their acceptance letters to get enough of you accepting to hit the target class size. These are questions that have great import for the organizations, at least, even if you may not find them fascinating the way you do, say, um, questions about whether God exists. I don't know. I'm making up something totally difficult there. All right, so how can we work from this kind of nebulous question, a question that has no importance to anybody but me, or a question which is ill-specified and not specific enough? How can we work from weak to strong? Let's give some examples. So politics, the too vague version is, what impacts politics in America, okay? Let's stop and think for a second about what is the problem, problem with that statement. Does anybody have anything to say about that? You're right. Absolutely. Impacts is really vague, right? I mean, what's an impact? There's so many impacts. How, what, is, what are we measuring with an impact? Can you give me a, a number of impact? Right. So... We need to refine that clearly, okay? Um, also, the what question is ridiculously vague. You know, I think that's even more vague than the verb. <laughs> um, what means an infinite number of choices? What in all of America? What in all of the world? What in astrology impacts politics in America, right? So, um, Clearly, we need to refine this question somewhat. So let's take, a, let's take a stab at the what. Let's limit it to pop culture. Does pop culture have an impact? But remember that question we got a minute ago from the back row there. Impact. That doesn't make much sense. So we need to refine that still. Oh, I did this out of order. Sorry because my slides actually say the next thing is to refine pop culture because pop culture is too vague. All right, so American TV shows. And refine that into South Park because I, I come from Colorado. I actually, um, I, my bus stop looked a lot like South Park when I grew up. So uh, clearly South Park has an effect on American politics. But now we really need to get at that impact. How can we make this a measurable phenomena? Okay, so let's refine the impact question. Is there a relationship between words in South Park episodes and American politics? Okay, so at least like the impact now is being limited to an association, okay, that certain words in South Park seem to be coupled with particular American politics. Wait, particular American politics? Like, what does that even mean? American politics is super vague. Okay, so uh, can we clarify that even more? Oh, see, I keep jumping the gun. Um, is there a relationship between the sentiment of political words in South Park and American politics? Okay, so sentiment is a term which means the emotional content okay so words can words are labeled out there in certain natural language processing uh, circles where they they try to produce um, these algorithms these data sets that say hey for a certain word that is a positive emotion or a negative emotion for instance okay so yeah and like we talked about earlier during the uh, the facebook uh, study so South, so South Park words, American politics, and right, this is where we get to that final stage that I kept previewing but was jumping the gun on. Is it a relationship between the sentiment of political words in South Park and the American president's approval rating? Okay, so now we have a question which seems 
to me like it's specific enough that we could come up with a way to measure it, right? This, essentially, the sentiment of political words is something that I think we could deal with, right? I'm familiar with natural language processing algorithms, which can identify particular words and come up with a rating of their emotional sentiments. We can get South Park and we can get the transcripts from it, or we can use a machine learning algorithm to make a transcript. And America's presidential approval rating, I mean, there's, there's all this data out there about polling. I'm sure we can get that kind of data. So it seems like it's maybe specific enough to ask. We're also at the point where we have to think, is this something that's interesting? Is this something that not only we could do, but that we would want to do? All right, so let's do another example. So causes of death. So right. Which causes of death get attention in the news is maybe where some managerial type comes in and floats this question to the data science team, right? We want to know what causes of death really get attention in the news. Well, um, that we've already established that the what is a big problem, okay? What is an infinite sized problem? So let's narrow it down to a particular kind of cause of death. Do terrorist attacks get reported too much? Hmm. Well, you know, we've got a problem there in that too much, what does that mean? Okay, so maybe we can make that more specific. Is there a relationship between the number of people who die in terrorist attacks relative to the amount of media attention a story gets? This is starting to feel really concrete. Okay, but maybe we feel like, you know, actually, why limit it to terrorist attacks at this point? Because now we've got something so concrete, but I think we could expand this back out to more causes of death. So maybe we can figure out a way to get more interesting and more impact by looking at all the causes of death that are reported in the news. And we want to see if they're reported more you know, maybe not media attention, because we know the media is kind of, you know, sensationalist uh, at times, but where is it related to the frequency that people actually die from this cause? If you don't know, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, keep up statistics about death in the United, Se in the United States. Uh, so they, they publish every year how many people die due to car accidents, how many people die due to falling off ladders, how many people die due to blah, blah, blah. And um, rather famously, there are some amazingly weird causes of death that get reported in the CDC data. Um, dying from getting tangled in your bed sheets is an actual cause of death that is reported and the number is greater than zero each year. It's because there's, what, like 300-something million people in the United States, so that gives you a lot of leeway to get really weird things happening over the course of a year. Um, so we have statistics. We know how frequently a particular cause of death exists in our country. So maybe we could get some question about how frequently those News, those deaths are reported in the news and whether they're under or over reported. Okay. So, but the news is a problem because the news is again one of these nearly infinite kinds of things. So, I don't know how many thousands of news sources there are between newspapers and TV stations and at this point blogs and websites, right? Um, so let's limit it to things that we know we have good data access to, which is really major newspapers like the New York Times or The Guardian and Google Trends, okay, which give us another data source, which is not the old fashioned print media. So um, I ask you one more thing, which is not really about nailing down the question, because that last question 
is actually a very specific and I feel quite addressable thing. But one other thing you should think about is how to, how your questions being, the format that you're asking the question, whether it influences the answer, okay? Because if you ask this question relative to data up to 2019, you don't get any coronavirus stuff. And if you're looking for an, uh, a, you know, something which has got an enormous chunk of the media landscape, it's coronavirus, right? So I think if you include your data up to 2019, you're going to get one kind of result, and you're going to get a very different kind of result if you include 2020. All right. So let's try another one. Policing. Too vague. Why isn't police response time always the same? You know, you call 911, they show up in three minutes or 30 minutes. So we can get at questions like, how can we improve police response time? Which actually, in my eye, is not a lot better. So we can ask, do crime levels and time of day affect response time? Okay, now we have some metrics at least. Um, we can get even more specific and ask the question, where could police cars be stationed accounting for crime levels and time of day to make police response times equitable? Hmm. Well, this is an interesting change. I want to highlight the jump between the do crime levels and time of day affect response time and this question. Okay? So I think we can get metrics for crime levels and when crimes take place and the response time. So I think do crime levels and time of day affect response time is probably something which is fully answerable. The, the metrics exist. They're pretty well defined. I don't see a lot of room for wiggle in that. But the one of those is a neutral question. Okay. The second one is a question with a goal. Okay, it's a question which inherently stakes uh, an ethical position that having things be equitable is important, right? It, it implies that we shouldn't accept that in poor neighborhoods or minority neighborhoods that uh, there might be a 30 minute response time to a burglary call and in the rich neighborhood there might be a three minute response time. There's other things that we can talk about here, which get kind of beyond the scope, but fundamentally, this is a big jump in the importance of a question. And it also comes from a standpoint where we have established a value system that this person who's asking this question cares deeply about and wants the question answered. Okay. So one final refinement we might throw on this is to make this a more limited question, okay? Because we probably can't get this data for the entire United States or certainly not the entire world. So if we limit it to a location that we can address and maybe a location that, again, since this comes from a value perspective, an ethical perspective, about a, a location that somebody may be tied to and feels very strongly about. All right. So those are three examples of how to refine a question to the point where it feels important enough to address and it's something specific enough that can be addressed. Now, I kind of heard some rumbling from the back of the room earlier, right? I, this, this all seems too hard for me. I'm, a, I'm a, a hardcore facts person. I don't want to deal in this kind of, you know, mushy stuff about human intentions and, and this kind of thing. I, I just feel like as a data scientist, it's the management's job or my customer's job to give me the question they want to answer. It's not my responsibility. And to that, I have this to say. You know, you know I, and when you work in software even, you find that this never happens, okay? Um, let alone in data, okay? So 
in the software world, there's a long tradition actually that um, dates back to when I was first learning to program where people were making joke after joke after joke about how the boss or the customer comes in, sits down in the meeting and says something so vague that the programmers can't even interpret it, okay? Or even worse is that the, uh, they come in week one and they say something vague and the programmers push them until they get to something specific enough to implement and they write out this huge nice specification that says exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to make the software and then at week seven in the project they come into a meeting and the boss asks them to do something completely different changing the specification in the question okay this is like a, a trope and like you know memes before there were memes out there kind of situation so uh, you're never going to see this um, the the customer the boss generally doesn't have the training that you do as a data scientist okay that that boss needs you to step in and gently guide them to the the core question of what they are they want okay so um actually let me back up the slide i shouldn't have gone forward yet um so let's imagine that the boss comes in and they want to ask you something about um there we go so they they ask you what do our customers like about this product okay um so you're like oh my god that's so nebulous but you don't say that out loud because it's your boss right what you have to do that as an as the analyst is you you should here's what you shouldn't do right you shouldn't immediately just say okay boss and go off on Twitter and do some keyword searches and see if that solves your problem good enough to make the boss happy. No, you care about truth, right? So you need to explain to the boss that this to answer this question accurately is likely going to take time and money, right? That you need to maybe like do some surveys, collect data. You might have to go into stores, create some focus groups, this kind of thing. And the manager says, no, 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 we need, we need an answer in 12 hours. And you're like, okay, so here's what I can do. If you need it that fast, I can go ahead and, you know, do this Twitter search for keywords related to our products. Um, but I'm not, I, you need to explain to the boss at this point, what's lacking from that, right? That not every one of their customers uses Twitter. In fact, probably only a small subset and probably a very specific demographic of rich, educated people is more likely to be on Twitter, perhaps, than every customer, okay? And they're not necessarily going to post what they like on Twitter, right? That may just be a few people that are looking for some social media kudos, okay? Um, so, you know, there's huge limitations to Twitter data as an index of customer satisfaction. So you explain that to the boss, you get through to them, you're saying, look, given the time frame you've given me, this is what I can ask, but it's not actually the question you really wanted to ask. It's not the important question that you were interested in. And it's an important question. To answer it, we need these resources, okay? So now what you've done is you've educated your boss. You've given them something that they wanted potentially, even if it's unsatisfactory, and you've maybe set the stage for your boss to find the resources to ask the important question, to get in there and spend the money and the time to get the research out there, okay? So that is the nature of being a data scientist, right? You're, you're in there to help them. So, all right, so some, some other things just to kind of note back to that earlier thing where I said that this used to be a big joke in programming at all. Um, so let me get my things up, I apologize. All right, highlighter. Um, the waterfall method of software development is what I was alluding to a minute ago. 
So the waterfall method is the old fashioned thing from the 70s through the 90s, where you come into meetings, you design exactly what's going to happen with the software. And only once the design is fully done, do you go and move and start to put your fingers to the keyboard and make it go. Okay, and then there's these separate stages and one stage leads to another leads to another and you don't go backwards you don't let the customer come in and change the question on you okay more recently the world of programming has moved towards things that are vaguely fall into the category of called agile development methods in these kinds of worlds you are not moving straight forward in a line you are maybe like in the prototyping thing, starting with some questions, developing a little bit of stuff, testing it, realizing it was insufficient and the approach was wrong, refining the approach and the questions and going onwards and onwards until some point you, de you deploy the software. Uh, or maybe more commonly in the Silicon Valley world is things where it's a never ending process where there's always modifications. The customer comes in and changes the requirements on you all the dang time. And that's okay because the process is made to do that is to iterate on the software quickly and continually. So these are methodologies for doing software engineering, but you can see them as metaphors for how data science can work. And you can even use these tools actually when you're doing data science. Big data science software projects certainly operate under one of these tools, okay? But even like as an, an, an analyst doing an analysis, not making a new package, right? But doing an analysis, you can use these same concepts to start with your customer, formulate a question a little bit, just like we were doing just now in the slides, right? Go back and forth come up with a question you're willing to go off and work on for a little bit, come to some results that are kind of like, oh, well, actually, we didn't really understand. We couldn't really measure this the right way, or the data isn't available or something, and then go back with the customer, iterate again, over and over and over again. So data science can be an iterative process, hopefully eventually converging on a useful analysis. All right. So assuming something more like a waterfall model where you have a question and now you're ready to rock, what should happen next? Should it become a project? Okay. Um, so I think you have to ask yourself some questions your, about your question. <laughs> so questions about your question that may determine if it's a good enough question to move forward with. We already kind of talked about importance and specificity, right? Is this something that you want to move forward with and spend the time on? Is it something which you can, which you've refined to the point where you can actually type it into a program? So the other things that may drop this out of the world of projects and throw it into the trash bucket is constraints, right? Um, do we have to pay an unreasonable amount of money to get access to the data we need? Uh, do we have enough you know, people power hours to actually get this project done? Uh, is there a time frame for this to be useful and we don't think we could accomplish it? Do we not have the computing resources to actually undertake this, right? These are questions that are constraints of time, effort, interest, resources, computationally, money-wise, whatever, okay? You also have to ask yourself about the positives and negatives of undertaking this project. There may be sure costs and sure benefits. Those are obviously needing to be enumerated. There may be things that are potential risks and rewards that you also need to take into account. So if your project could maybe potentially cause great, great harm, like I don't know, like causing mass social unrest because you're doing some very extreme version of the Facebook study that makes people very sad and angry with each other, okay? You need to consider that before you undertake the project, right? Um, and, and that includes the ethical things, but it also includes monetary and, uh, you know, physical risks and stuff like that.
okay? And lastly, you do want to actually define a metric, if you can, that determines the success of the project, some measurement of the project attained the goal in the question. And, uh, you know, you have to think about whether you want to undertake something where you can't ever say you're done or you've succeeded. All right. All right. So I want to leave off really here with this idea that even questions that you can't answer might be worth asking, okay? Uh, you might have the full specification where you could write out a program, but the data isn't available. Or uh, maybe it's not that the data isn't available, but the data is impossible. Like, I'd like to know every spark of activity in the human brain as I am saying this to understand how I am saying this but it is not feasible. It's not just that nobody's done the measurement. There's no technology to do that measurement. Okay. So, but asking questions can still be worthwhile. Okay. In the case of understanding how my brain operates to make speech, I might come up with some thought experiments and those might lead me to asking another question that I can address, that I can design an experiment for in the lab, all right? So we can guide the project to questions that can be answered with data available. Or you could potentially see this as a huge opportunity and start a whole new project to actually gather up the technology and the money and the time to get the data that would answer this very important question. So in another case, just raising an unanswerable question can change how people think and react by putting out there the idea that, um, that, it is, uh, that there is no data on how very poor people in the third world get money to undertake new projects and make their lives better, right? So like a farmer can't, we don't know if a farmer in, you know, part of uh, the Belgian Congo, how they can get money to undertake an improvement on their farm, right? So this is a terrible thing because like, we might be able to make a huge improvement in people's lives if we could get that data. And just raising a question can cause people to think and change the way they act and in the end, maybe somebody starts a nonprofit, which goes in and starts doing lending and seeing what happens in the Belgian Congo because somebody asked that question. Um, and so just to kind of close out when we talk about this stuff, when we talk about things like maybe guiding a project to a question that can be answered with the data available, you do have to keep one thing in mind that asking the easy question is still not the same thing as asking the interesting question, okay? Especially in the internet world, like where Twitter is this huge, amazing data source, people go in and ask questions on tw about Twitter data all the time because it's easy and available. It doesn't mean that Twitter has any bearing on the process they care about that they're asking the question you know, about American politics or uh, stuff like that, right? Again, there may be a very limited slice of people who are Twitter active and it may be corrupted by bots and so forth. Okay, so what it says about American politics, it's the easy data, not the data that actually gets to things. So when you guide people to ask questions about available data, you still have to think about whether you're asking questions with the right data and whether the problem you can actually address is still an interesting one with these data sources. Um, and that's why I have this cartoon on the side here called the streetlight effect. This is a well-known kind of cognitive phenomena in psychology that people do tend to go to where it's easy to ask a question rather than trying the hard thing. Okay. So it's the, uh, it's just an old story that uh, got turned into a psychology thing where a 
policeman comes across a drunk person who's on their hands and knees looking for a lost item. And after helping them search for a really long time and not finding it, they ask the, the person, are you sure you lost it right here? And the person goes, no, it was over there, but it's too dark over there. I can't see anything. Okay. So you, you get the concept, right? In summary, what we're after here is some sort of way in which you can take a vague idea, possibly your own, possibly from a boss or a customer, morph it into a question that is specific enough to answer, that you can muster the data to ask the question. And then at that point, you can evaluate, is this something good enough for me to go forward with? Do I have the resources, the time, the kinds of things I need to do this? And when I've reduced it to something accomplishable, is it still worth going at? And then the flip side, that even when it's not accomplishable, maybe it's still worthwhile putting that question out there. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to close us out with uh, a little bit of a, um, a little quiz question. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna flash up the video quiz. And what you're gonna see in it is a, um, a question, two questions to answer, one of which is kind of an open-ended thing. It's a project for you to do what we just did, take something from a vague statement into a specific and potentially answerable one. So good luck with that. I hope you all have a fun week. Bye.